Hey, this is Austin Fitch from Horizon Investments. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, really appreciate everybody jumping on this afternoon and taking the time out of your day uh, to to go through kind of our view on the markets and what we're seeing, uh, what uh, what we've seen so far this year. It's, it's I think fair to say it's been a pretty eventful start to 2020. So I think we've got some good info here that we're going to run through. I'm I'm joined by our uh, CIO, Scott Ladner, uh, and really looking forward to diving in today. Just as a housekeeping note before we get started, I think most folks on the call probably know this, but if there are questions along the way, I would say don't hesitate to type them in to the GoToWebinar chat box. Uh, we're happy to take them that way. It's probably the easiest way uh, to address questions. and. Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully uh, weave them into the conversation as it makes sense. Uh, if we're unable to get to them uh, as part of the back and forth, we will absolutely uh, try and get to them at the end of the conversation. The goal today is hopefully to spend about half an hour uh, really going through, again, like I said, the, the views that we have on what has transpired so far, uh, but probably more importantly, what we see uh, going forward. So with that said, um, and, and with this concept of, of going forward, I, I think the theme for this quarter, or for this this presentation for us is, is really what's around the bend. So this idea of we have absolutely experienced, I think it's uh, a, a pretty historic uh, first half of the year. And then looking out into the second half of the year, there's a number of, of issues that really are, are at the forefront, uh, the, the virus being one of them. Uh, we're going to talk about the consumer and what we're seeing there in regards to the, the resiliency. Uh, we'll talk about the stimulus. Um, I think that's probably something that maybe hasn't gotten as much press as we think it probably deserves in, in regards to how it's influencing global capital markets. Uh, and then finally, we will absolutely touch on the election, uh, knowing that November is fast approaching and that's something that uh, undoubtedly can have an impact on uh, on the markets themselves. Uh, so with no further ado, we will dive in. And, and as mentioned just a second ago, the, the virus being top of mind for, for really probably everyone, uh, I would say globally at this point. Um, and, and I think what we're seeing here is the idea that, that maybe the data sets that we've looked at, even within the last three months, are, are changing. And, and they're doing so pretty frequently. Uh, Scott, I'll, I'll maybe toss it to you and, and say, maybe walk us through this chart, but more more broadly, what we're looking at in regards to the virus and, and obviously the impact and the effects on the markets. Yeah. Hey, Austin, and, and hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for your time, as always. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try to be to the point here and, and, and offer you some insight. You know, one, one thing that we, we are paying attention to, obviously, is like you have to pay attention to COVID. Um, it is the dominant theme in, in markets right now. It is the dominant theme. In, well, not, well, I should stop. It's not necessarily the dominant theme in markets, but it's certainly the dominant thing in, in the news headlines. Um, and, the, the, and the dominant theme within the dominant theme in the news headlines is new case count. And, you know, that is certainly spiking. Uh, we would argue that that may not be the most relevant metric that folks are, are watching or really caring about and driving behavior. It is, we do think it's impacting behavior some. We'll get into that. Um, but, it, but, it, but, it is, we think it's become increasingly less relevant if, you, if it's not followed at some point by uh, increased death rate. So there's a chart on the right. So we, you know, we have seen the spike. Starting about a month ago, we've seen the spike in, in cases. Um, that is obviously real. Like we're, not, we're not saying this, this is not a, you know, a, a, a spike that's, that's false. But we have not seen, and, and this is even accounting for with, you know, the, 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 the lag, uh, which tends to be about two weeks historically, uh, between, between new cases and, 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 a, and a commensurate rise in deaths. We haven't seen a rise in, in, in death rate yet, um, and and that's you know probably largely due to the fact that the, the preponderance of the folks that are getting sick right now are people that are under the age of 34, and the mortality rate for somebody under the age of 34 is 0.03% nationwide so far, um, and so when you, we have not seen the, the commensurate rise in, in deaths, um, and we th we think at some point that is going to start to get people's attention. Um, you know if this turns into a to, to an epidemic where people are not uh, you know where, where people are not assuming that they're going to uh, be, be seriously ill and, and, and probably die if they if they get it, uh, then that that we do think will in, end up impacting consumer behavior. But 
but new cases isn't really the thing that we're watching right now. It's really the it's really the mortality rate is the thing that we're we're really starting to pay attention to to see if it flows through from the from the new cases, and the best part is not. And, and Scott, I think you, you bring up a good point in regards to the impact on economic activity. I think it's it's super important to understand uh, what specific data point that maybe the market's paying closest attention to. Uh, I also think it's important uh, w when we were looking at the the data from from COVID specifically. That's pretty high frequency data, but I think high frequency data in general right now is extremely critical. We've got a couple of charts on, on this slide, but maybe talk us through at a high level why the frequency is important and then, and then maybe talk us through in a little bit more detail these charts that we're looking at here. Yeah, I and mean, we, we, you know, we've, we've made a point last quarter during webinars, if you guys are on with this last quarter, that, that measuring the, the pace of economic activity is going to be the, the, the key metric in figuring out the, how the virus is going to impact capital markets. Um, not humanity, but, but, but capital markets. And so th there are, there's a plethora of, 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 uh, of high frequency data available and anywhere from uh, places like home base um, to, uh, to open table reservations, um, to pollution data, to traffic data, to mobility data. You know, there's, there's lots of things you can look at. Um, and we're just pulling a few of them here to, to give you a sense because most of these data series right now are telling you about the same story, that we've recovered uh, you know, a good deal, 60 or 70% recovery thus far from kind of pre-virus activity levels. Um, but it does appear that we're that we're starting to plateau, um, and so you know, and that you know, it may be due because you know, maybe due to the, the the you know the surge of new cases and, and the headlines associated with that that have been kind of universally dour. Um, but but uh, but but we do we do want to see a pick back up in this in this activity. Um, we're not seeing it right now in, in, in high frequency data, and that is that is one thing that's giving us a little bit of pause. Um, but but these 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 data sources and like I said, I was listed three here. Um, but there are probably 15 or 20 of them that we look at on a pretty regular basis um, that, that to, to get a gauge as to what is the consumer doing, like what are what are folks actually doing, how are they acting, um, and and you know like if if we if we do see a uh, you know if we do see this activity level start to rise again and come off this kind of 80 percent plateau level um, that we've been stuck at here for a few days, uh, that that'll end up being helpful. If we do see it turn down, uh, that'll give us some pause. But we're right at an inflection point right now, right now which is pretty important. And Scott, you, you talk about an inflection point. I think that's something that, that's worth noting, um, that, that there have been a, a lot of different types of data that have come out over the last three, four months now, um, and, and you've gotten signals in a variety of different directions. Uh, we've gotten the question from a number of, of advisors who undoubtedly are getting questions from their clients. You know, why is the market continuing to go higher um, based on, you know, the, the data that we just looked at? Economic activity is, is not nearly what it was even six months ago. So why is the market continuing to go higher? And, and I, think, uh, I think it's fair to say that it's not just retail investors um, being the ones that are confused. I, I think on, on this chart, I think what you would say, Scott, and, and feel free to chime in, really professional money managers are, are maybe as confused as the retail folks at this point. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we definitely detect that. So not just in conversations with, you know, we, we, we talk to uh, the hedge fund community and, the, and, the, and, the, and, you know, the kind of the Wall Street community, uh, our peers and, and, and you know, in, in our space as well. There, there is a lot of confusion in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the professional money management community. And this was one way that I, that, that I thought was a, a pretty succinct way to, 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 to describe that. Um, so these are some, some uh, data series from, uh, from BAML. Uh, that that do uh, fund manager surveys, as they say, you know, survey of professional fund money managers. And the first chart is this equity overvaluation composite indicator. So what that's telling you is that the professional money market, market the professional money management community, um, thinks the market is more overvalued than at any time, even including the dot com bubble. Okay. But the, but the, the bottom right chart is showing that the that that uh, change of cash level is actually down a, a bunch. In other words, people put like hedge funds are putting money to work this this quarter, um, and that's le that's led to the top right uh, panel, which is showing the 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 net exposure to equity markets is amongst its highest it's been in 15 years. So hedge funds think the market is overvalued, yet they're putting cash to work, and their exposure to equity markets is about as high as it's ever been. Um, if that's not a picture of confusion for you, I don't really know what is. But Austin, we're you know, we're going to discuss here in a second why that actually might make some sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I, I think it's important to Scott, uh, so I know we're talking 
kind of what professional money managers are doing, I think it's also important to think about what um, what you're seeing from a, a, a fundamental kind of valuation perspective. And, and you mentioned um, this idea of maybe markets look somewhat overvalued. I think it's really interesting, though, if you take a step back and look at earnings per share changes, uh, that's the chart on the left uh, on this page. What you see here is year-over-year -year change in, in quarterly earnings is, is actually as, about as negative as it's been over the last 30 years, really in, in the realm of, of where we were uh, in 2008, so the, the great financial crisis. Uh, and and on the face of it, that seems like a, a bad sign, right? But then I, I would say read the headline here on this slide. Keep in mind that really markets are a discounting mechanism, right? And, and what does that mean? Okay, so let's look historically. When you've had those changes in earnings year over year, what has that meant from a, a subsequent S&P, uh, in this case, return on a forward-looking basis? And you'll note that the chart on the right, so there's a lot of numbers there, but we've highlighted a few different uh, a few different rows. And, and what you would note that there have been times uh, where earnings changes have, have fallen maybe to the extent or, or close to the extent that they have over the last three and six months, right? And, and you can see that May of 2009, uh, June of, of 2009 are a couple that we've highlighted here. Um, but it's important to look out, okay, so what does that mean going forward? Does that automatically mean that, that the stock market is going to go lower? And, and what you would see historically is actually the exact opposite. And it's this idea that possibly, and, and maybe this is the way to think about it, quite possibly when earnings fall that much that the markets in essence have already kind of baked in all of the bad news. And you can see the subsequent returns, whether it's three months, whether it's six months, tend to be positive really across many of those periods where you actually had earnings changes significantly drop on a year-over-year -year basis. You can see May of 2009, the subsequent three months, it was up 11, up 19% on the six-month number. Again, that's not to suggest that it has to go higher from here, but it is important to realize that you're looking at a, at a market that, that is discounting on a forward-looking basis. Uh, it's keeping, it, it keeps in mind the fact that maybe the, the bad news, in a sense, has already been, like I said, already been factored in. And then if I would tell you the other thing is, is if we look at, um, the, look at the specific companies, and this is where I would say kind of drilling down into uh, into the S&P 500 or the, the Russell 2000, really broad equity markets, I think it's really important to see some of the divergence across the universe of, of companies. Uh, you can see here we've separated this, we've separated companies out and, lo and we're looking at revenue expectations over the next 12 months. Uh, a, a positive number means that we expect them to be higher. A lower number means that we expect them to be lower. And what you'll note is that actually larger companies uh, tend to have higher expectations and, and better revenue expectations a year from now uh, than they even do today, uh, which is important to note because, right, keep in mind, we're, we're coming off really the, uh, I would say, unprecedented shutdown of a global economy that, is, that has really never happened before. Now, you can see on the flip side of that, how it's affected maybe smaller companies. And, and this is probably not surprising if you think about companies that may have been hurt more by a, an economic shutdown and then companies that would have been hurt less, right? Companies that have better infrastructure, maybe more access to capital, um, they, they have greater flexibility uh, in regards to technology. Those are the type of companies that, that you would expect to maybe withstand a, a shutdown like we had not surprising those are going to be your larger companies, whereas maybe your smaller companies, companies that have maybe less than, than $500 million in revenue, maybe those are the companies that are going to face more headwinds in the coming year. And I think that's important, especially as we look at allocation across the portfolios as to where there may be opportunity, knowing that, like we talked about just last slide, uh, that, that just because earnings were downgraded doesn't necessarily mean that, that the market's going down on a forward-looking basis. 
So kind of transitioning from the business side of things to the consumer side of things, uh, Scott, I, I think it's, it's pretty impressive to see the, the consumer, specifically in the U.S., but, but even more broadly, looking at it from a global perspective, how the consumer has really uh, bounced back uh, over the last, call it, three months. Um, and I think this data set here does a good job highlighting that, but maybe talk us through that and, and what we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, th so you know, this is, again, this is one well, one series we can show you a lot of different types of things um, that are all pointing to the same the same general direction, that folks don't expect this to last a really, really long time. They have very good expectations for the future. That, you know, nobody, like, people do not think this is going to be um, impacting their lives in a negative way for, for a very long time. Uh, and so this is a picture of resilience, of resiliency. Um, and and that's, that, that is that's not only encouraging, but it's, you know, you could say it's a little bit expected. I mean, you know, like, the current situation is, uh, is kind of crummy. Um, the future has to look better. It doesn't, it doesn't always have to look better. I mean, there's been periods of time where, um, you know, people did not actually think it was going to get a whole lot better, uh, or at least quickly. Um, and, and right now, they, they're, they're expecting things to bounce back pretty well. Uh, they're expecting their own personal situation to bounce back pretty well as well, as we'll highlight here in a minute. Um, but this, this, this is probably a little bit bifurcated uh, by, by income group, um, and, and, and that's certainly due to some of, some of the stimulus measures that have been passed thus far and are probably going to be passed again in the future. Yeah, uh, Scott, I think that's a great point. And, and this is a, a pretty interesting chart because if you look at it, what it would tell you, right, is that uh, lower income consumers are actually almost back to spending at, at the rates that they were at the beginning of the year, uh, pre-COVID, if you will, uh, whereas maybe your higher income earners uh, are still well, well below kind of where, where we were at the beginning of the year from a, uh, from, from a stimu stimulus perspective, as, as Scott mentioned. Uh, the lower income earners are going to be those that are maybe more positively affected, whereas the higher income earners, uh, maybe it's a, a it's a marginal impact on on kind of net assets. So I think that's important to understand uh, just the the disparity between the consumer today and and Scott, you mentioned it, and I think this is something that we're watching, uh, especially as we head towards the end of July, is you know what's the the possibility of that that additional stimulus or the, the additional uh, extension of those unemployment benefits. Uh, and, and I think that's maybe unknown at this point, but something that we're definitely watching. Is that fair? No, it is. And, and, it's, and you know, we, we think, like, look, they're gonna, there's going to be another bill. Um, it probably comes in, in early August. Uh, but, but, the, but to think that there's not going to be another bill in an election year um, with what's going on is, is sort of silly. Um, there is, you know, the... <laughs> I, I heard it said this morning by somebody that, that you know deficit hawks are an endangered species. Um, be that as it may, it's like it is it is likely the truth, and and so we should certainly expect a, you know more more stimulus that be that will be targeted more at the middle and lower end uh, again um, as you know as, as as you know as it probably should be in this case. Um, but look you know look, looking looking a little bit at a little bit longer time series of, of this, um, this is I just think this is a fascinating chart. Um, at, you know this this is showing um, what. How how people think about their own finances, and this you know this goes back 15 years. And it's a daily survey that, that one of our research partners, uh, Cornerstone Macro, uh, provides. And, and 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 the graph on the left is showing you know how you know, if if I ask you the question how do, how would you rate your own personal finances? Is essentially the, the you know the, the people that say excellent or good minus the people that say it's we're, we're in pretty bad shape. And I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. One of them is look at how high it is. Uh, like coming into the crisis, like look, uh, coming into COVID, look at how dang high it is. You know, it's, it's you know, somewhere around 50% more people uh, were thinking that their their personal finances were excellent or good relative to poor, um, and that, that's that's an astonishing number. And, you know, compare that to the period coming into the great financial crisis, when said that, that number is somewhere around 20, you know, only 20% of folks uh, believed that you know more, only 20% more people believed that their financial position was 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 in good shape relative to bad shape. Um, and that obviously deteriorated through the crisis. So, you know, so one is, uh, you know, one point to, to bring out of this is one, that people came into this crisis in a really strong place. And, it, and not only because if you wanted a job, you had a job, but also because debt levels have been paid down a ton over the last decade. So people's personal balance sheets were in really, really strong shape coming into this. And, that, and I don't think that should be forgotten. And, you know, like we came into this period from a position of, of really nice strength from a consumer standpoint. The other thing that the, the you know the probably the more obvious thing to look at is how has it changed over you know really since COVID and you can see it drop off pretty severely um, right when the economy got shut down 
Um, but the, 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 the move back towards normality has been staggering, has been staggeringly quick. Um, so, so we're back at the sort of pre-COVID levels of how people view their own personal finances. Now, is that due to stimulus? Like, clearly. Like, clearly there's, there's, a, there's a stimulus part of that. Um, but it's also because businesses are reopening. It's also because people are, are starting to get back towards some level of, of economic activity. Um, and so, you know, we, we, can, we think this is going to continue, but it, it bodes very well for small businesses eventually uh, if they're allowed to stay open, and it bodes very well for the U.S. economy on a go-forward basis. So, Scott, we, we've talked about the, the consumer. I think it's an interesting, um, an interesting kind of data point then to look at, at this chart, and I know we've, we've looked at this chart in the, in the past. Uh, specifically 2018, 2019, and we had talked about money sitting on the sidelines. And I, I think it's really interesting now to see just how much money, knowing that individuals and consumers view their personal finances maybe the way that they do, um, maybe just how much money is is sitting on the, the sidelines. And, and I, what comes to mind for me is this idea of specifically maybe folks that are, are nearing retirement um, and this concept of, of, in essence, being maybe somewhat overprotected or overconservative. And, and for me, that I think through to, uh, again, the, the folks that are a couple years from retirement. And yes, they absolutely need some level of downside risk mitigation. I think that's a, a fair statement to make. But purely sitting on the sidelines or, or being overly conservative to an extent, I think, is, is also maybe uh, can end up being a little bit more of a, a problem longer term, knowing that uh, I think, Scott, as you've said many times before, one of the best risk mitigation tools is to be able to capture gains when they're available. Um, and unfortunately, the folks that are sitting on the sidelines obviously aren't, aren't capturing those gains. Is there anything else maybe that I'm missing or, or this concept of being overprotected? Is that that resonate kind of with your what you're looking at? Well, I mean, it does, and and, and especially if you're trying to solve a 20 or 30 year spending problem. Um, and, and so, you know, having having exposures to to risk assets, especially in the environment that we're in right now, um, is going to be one of the key financial planning uh, tools that we can we can actually use on, on a go forward basis. I know we're going to talk about that more in a little bit, but just this idea, just this this graph of how much cash is on silent, and this is and this is this is more retail money than than institutional money uh, in, in, in the ICI data. Um, you know, like $4.6 trillion of, of money, of, of, of dollars in the in money market accounts is, is pretty astounding. Um, that, that money will get put back to work at some point, and that will provide a pretty nice tailwind. Uh, yeah, and I, and I would say don't, uh, don't miss here kind of what we're saying. We're not saying to put your 65-year-old client in a, you know, 80% equity, you know, aggressive portfolio. I, I think there's, uh, there's absolutely a type of portfolio that maybe makes sense. And, and again, this idea of maybe a, a protection type portfolio or somebody that's focused on risk mitigation, maybe that's the way to step them into, into the market and, and get that money off the sidelines. So, so it's just something kind of that, that came to mind when looking at that. I, I think another piece that, I mean, we talk about, uh, you know, money sitting on the sidelines. I think another piece to talk about is, is just the, the Fed balance sheet and how much money is sitting on that right now. I think, Scott, the, the data in this chart alone is uh, staggering, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, I, that, when, I, when I was thinking about how to display um, this, the speed and the magnitude with which the, the, the Fed specifically, but, but, you know, this is true for, for most global central banks, but, but, but the Fed is, is sort of near and dear to everybody on this call chart probably because we're living in the United States. Um, it, you know, the, after, after the great financial crisis, it took the Fed uh, over five years to add $3 trillion to their balance sheet. A lot of money, um, but it's also a long time. This time, it took them less than three months to add three trillion dollars to the balance sheet. Um, and by the way, they're not done. Uh, this could easily be nine or ten trillion by the end of the year, um, or at least certainly certainly within twelve months, we'd expect it to be somewhere around there. Um, and and so to to, um, to 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 say this has been a uh, remarkably unprecedented speed and, and forceful activity out of central banks um, isn't really doing it justice. I mean, there's just, there's just nothing that you can compare it to. Um, so, I, so I tried to compare it to the thing that we are the, the, the most recent bout of quantitative easing and, and just, just looking at the numbers, you know, suddenly it took five years, uh, just not, you know, barely a decade ago, uh, we just got it done in three months. Um, so if, you're, if, you're, if we're wondering, you know, how this is, how this market's recovering or how this money is finding its way into the system, and this, this is this is one 
this, this is one graph that will help help explain some of that stuff. Yeah, and, and Scott, the, the phrase that comes to mind when I look at this is, is the adage, you know, don't fight the Fed. And I, I think for me, uh, when, when I see that and, and thinking about folks that are doing financial planning, I think this, this should be, and we'll talk about kind of other tailwinds here in just a second, but, but this should be huge for folks that maybe do have time on their side, right? If, if they have time to invest, say a, a 25, 30, 40-year-old client, um, and the, the client that's focused on growing their assets and you have a, a Fed that has provided kind of that, that backstop in a sense, I think that's a, a huge boost to, uh, to somebody who's got time on their side. No doubt, and and, and, it's, and it's something that you need to take account of in in your asset allocation. Now we're thinking about on a go forward basis, how do I invest? So we we've, we've talked about tailwinds, and and I think it's also important. I mean, the, we've got a chart here that that really puts it into perspective from a global per perspective on the on the right hand side, but also when looking at the the interest rate component here on the left side. So Scott, talk to us a little bit more about these tailwinds and and what we're seeing in terms of opportunity kind of going forward. Yeah, I mean, so these are, this is again like a, a, a pretty straightforward way to gauge the um, the magnitude of the global stimulus. So, so and and this is not just monetary; this is both fiscal and monetary. Um, so yeah, the, the chart on the left is you know is, is showing um, essentially what the, what the change in the, in uh, the world equivalent of Fed funds is. And so so yeah, and and this it's it's inverted. So as as that number is going as that blue line or the purple line is going higher, it means that's more that's more rate cuts. Basically, on a global basis, and but rate cuts happen. You know, when rate cuts happen, it's not an immediate boost to the economy. I mean, it might be an immediate boost to financial markets for a short period of time, but 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 the, but rate cuts act with you know with like the, the the classic phrase with you know with uncertain and variable lags. Um, so somewhere between you know four and eight quarters later, we're gonna we're gonna start seeing the impact of these rate cuts. Well, we're not four to eight quarters uh, later from from when these from when these rate cuts have happened. Um, and so, you know, we, again, we entered the, we entered this period with some rate cuts and as, as a tailwind that we're, we thought we we're going to start taking an effect or having impact, uh, in the second quarter this year. Uh, but we just, but, but as, as a result of the COVID crisis, you know, all central banks essentially have cut to zero except for China. Um, and, and, and so we have to, we've got a massive tailwind for the next 12 to 24 months in terms of economic activity associated with, with cutting rates. So that part's not even, like that part's not even in the system yet. Um, so the you know the rate cut parts in the in, in the global economy haven't really taken hold. Um, so that's so that's a tailwind. So we got that going for us, which is nice. Um, the, but the, the the right side though is combines you know so that's that's kind of rate policy. But but if you if you look at um, quantitative easing or kind of monetary uh, you know monetary fiscal or monetary um, liquidity injection and fiscal stimulus, uh, and look around the world, it's again staggering. Um, in, in the United States, you're talking about 44% of GDP coming in as potential additional stimulus on top of the rate cuts that we've got. Um, and, and, you know, globally, you're talking, you know, close to 30% of, of, of global stimulus relative to GDP. It's a huge number. Um, and it's not, you know, one, it's not going away. Two, it's getting bigger. And three, what's the outlier on this graph? It's China. Right? China's a big economy. If they want to move, they're going to move not small. They're going to move big. So it, so you know, China has actually got a lot more room to go. We don't really care about Japan. Like Japan's the, the multiplier in Japan's stimulus is not that great. The multiplier in the U.S. And, and Chinese stimulus is massive. Um, and so if if we actually get some uh, some some additional stimulus out of China, this stuff these numbers are even bigger. Um, so the, you know, my point to this entire slide is the stimulus tailwinds have not they haven't really even gotten to us yet. Um, and a lot of them, certainly the rate ones have not, and a lot of the a lot of the monetary stuff is not yet either. Um, the, the, there, there is the potential for them to go up. Now, these numbers aren't going down. Uh, the, there is a, there, is a, and there's a high potential for them to get even bigger. So, the, fighting against this stimulus is a really tough job if you want to fight against it. Um, now, you may end up succeeding, but, but this is, this is a big, big checkbook that you're fighting against right now. Uh, and so that, that, that's, look, whether you agree with it or not is frankly irrelevant. Um, it's, it's reality. And and it and it, will, and it will impact markets and it has impacted markets. Uh, so you know we have to deal we have to learn how to deal with it rather than try to you know say oh that's dumb or that's or I don't agree with it like so, so nobody cares. Um, it, it's reality. So we have to so we have to adjust to it and and understand how to invest in that environment. 
Uh, Scott, that, that's a great point. I, I think the, the rate conversation, we've got another slide here with this idea. So this is a, a model put together and it, it kind of really shows the range of where a bunch of different types of models uh, that uh, I think you mentioned earlier, a partner from a research standpoint of ours, Cornerstone Macro, uh, they, they look at a number of different things. But what you'll note, and, and Scott, you just touched on this, is the idea that, that rates actually can and, and probably will continue to go lower uh, given where we are now. And, and I think that brings to mind for me a, a conversation and, and maybe a topic that we touched on uh, even last quarter. It's this idea of, of financial planning in this zero rate environment. Um, and I think that's where it, it creates challenges. Uh, it, it creates, uh, especially for folks that maybe have traditionally used uh, predominantly fixed income or, or clients that have portfolios um, and they're coming to you and, and wondering why they're, uh, they're drawing down on their accounts. And, and I think uh, hopefully folks on this call uh, we'll have solutions to offer that, that doesn't necessarily rely on pure fixed income to drive uh, kind of longer term distribution oriented uh, challenges. But, but Scott, what, what say you in regards to this idea of a zero interest rate environment and what it means for financial planning? Well, it means that you better not count on bonds to deliver you any return. Um, so, it, so, you know, the 60 40 portfolio over the last five years, about, you've gotten about half the return out of the portfolio out of the bond side. Um, you think that's going to happen going forward? With rates at zero, you know, tenure rate under under a percent, and you got these these rates aren't going anywhere. Like, there's no chance that the Fed raises rates for the next three years, and I would argue probably next to the next at least five. Um, and and so if if they if they don't raise short rates, then there's then the tenure rate is going to be kind of locked, and they're threatening uh, with with yield with, with yield curve control or yield caps. Um, so if 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 the, you know the the best predictor of a of, of the of a bond return is the current yield to maturity on it. So for investment grade bonds right now, that's about a percent, um, percent a quarter, somewhere around there. So that if, if that's your expectation for your, the fixed income return of the portion of your portfolio for the next five to ten years, which I think is probably rational, rational prediction, um, then you're gonna it's like that's not gonna drive any income. That that, that is not gonna drive any longevity. That that, that is not gonna drive any spending. Um, it, and so if for for spending portfolios or for somebody that is actually taking distributions, a 60/40 portfolio is gonna end up being a um, you have like that it, that you know, that has worked pretty well the last five years. It's really worked last 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 twenty years. Um, it's not going to work the same way going forward. Uh, it's just not 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 now that we have twenty trillion dollars in debt and there is no prospect for being able to raise rates either from a fiscal standpoint or from how the Fed models are working uh, anytime soon. So you know, like, don't count on fixed income to deliver you the same types of returns that they have the last either five or twenty years. Um, you're going to need to find another way to generate income for your clients. So, Scott, I think we've hit on the fact that, that low interest rates can absolutely create challenges. I guess the, the other side of the coin is, you know, there, there are absolutely folks, and, and in this case, companies that, that benefit themselves from low rates. So, uh, this is a chart that looks at uh, corporate borrowing rates. So, uh, we're, we're looking at here data over the last 20 years. I, I could have extended this all the way back to the 1940s, so 60 more years. And what you would see is the yields here that, that corporations uh, are having to pay on their, their debt that they're issuing is really as low as it's been since, you know, like it says here, World War II, uh, which, again, we talk about interest rates maybe creating challenges from a financial planning perspective, but I would argue that from a corporate planning perspective or a corporate finance perspective, it actually creates opportunity. Um, so that's something else to think about when you're thinking about companies looking at, you know, capital expenditures. Uh, they're looking at projects that they're undertaking or, or maybe they otherwise wouldn't undertake, but now they're able to uh, finance it at, at a lot more reasonable of a rate, or maybe they can take on more debt than they otherwise would uh, at, a, at a lower rate uh, and, and service that debt in a much easier fashion. So that's something uh, tying back into some of the fundamental stuff that we talked about earlier. But with a, an interest rate twist, I think it's really important to understand that, that there are folks, and, and like I said, in this case, companies uh, that benefit uh, pretty substantially from this, the fixed income and the interest rate environment that we're in. So, Scott, the, the last thing, and, and I feel like uh, we talk about this at the end of every call, uh, is, is politics. 
Um, and, and I think what we see here is there's absolutely been a shift uh, over the last three months in terms of expectations both on the in the presidential race and for that matter in the, the Senate race. So maybe Scott walk us through the, the data on this chart, but then let's more broadly talk about kind of what our expectations are uh, around the election as it as it heads into November, but probably even more specifically, when we start to think that really uh, impacts the markets or, or isn't a, uh, creates uh, some, some movement from a market perspective. Yeah, the election. <laughs> the gift that keeps giving. Um, you know, look, wait, wait, I, I got my, I feel that my first election question, uh, the, my first 2020 election question in October of 2019 at a dinner. Um, and I remember thinking like, oh my Lord, 13 months of this. Um, but we're, we're actually getting to the point now where we're just, because this makes a lot more sense to start analyzing. Um, and it's, it's fairly clear right now. Like, if, the, if the election were held in July, Trump would get trounced and the Democrats would sweep. It's not even close. Um, and, and, and don't, don't, don't talk to me about predicting, you know, about prediction markets being always wrong because they're just, because they're, they're not. Um, but so, you know, don't, don't count, don't count that one as just like, it's gotta be wrong. So I'll go the other way. Um, the, you know, the, the, you know, if this, if this election were held tomorrow, this, you know, this is, this not, this is not a contest. Um, elections in November and Biden has really not started campaigning, frankly. And, 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 uh, you know, we don't, we don't really think that this thing gets going hard. Um, until, uh, you know, we basically don't think the campaign, the campaign starts until the campaigning starts. And that's really going to begin in earnest, uh, when we get to, towards the, uh, towards the conventions, however they exist. And when we get to this uh, presidential debates, which begin on, on September 29th. Um, because if, if people have any doubts about Biden's mental acuity or anything else, um, you know, that there, there will be, there is going to be a form through which to explore that. Um, and so, you know, these, these numbers right now are saying this is, this is kind of a guaranteed lock for the Democrats across the board. Um, that may end up being the case. Uh, we just don't think it's, it's, it's quite smart to say this is a, this is a guaranteed outcome right now. Um, now, that's one side of it. So, like, the, the other side is like, okay, well, so then what's the market reaction uh, if, if, if we get that? Um, we, you know, we, we think it's, it's probably not a great market reaction if, them, if Democrats sweep. But, but, again, we don't think that's by any, by any interest in the imagination a guaranteed outcome right now. Um, I will push back, and you know, some of you may maybe may have heard uh, about the J.P. Morgan report that came out uh, that 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 was, um, you know, it's a, new, a headline grabbing. It comes from J.P. Morgan, and it's one of their one of their chief strategists, and it was essentially saying a, a Democratic sweep would be a neutral to positive development for the markets, uh, because and the, the the central rationale was Biden's not going to do all the stuff that he's talking about because we're because we're in crisis mode. I couldn't disagree strong more strongly with that. Like th that 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 logic train just just doesn't hold up to reality or to water or to history. Um, it the, the, you know the fact is when things when things get crisisy, uh, people tend to go bigger on 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 programs and they and they, they tend to go more extreme. They, like the, that famous line, "Never let a good crisis go to waste." Um, so the, the the thought that a, a a democratic sweep would be good for the S and P 500, um, we think is fundamentally challenged. Um, but we're not. We're, but we're not, we don't think what we're and you were close to that event right now. Um, and even if, if Biden were to win, and, and if, if Biden were to win and the Senate stays Republican, uh, then this is, you know, then we got divided government and the divided government's good. Um, but, but this is something we're going to be watching more closely as we, as we get, as we get closer, obviously. But we think it's really, um, probably not real smart to put a ton of, uh, you know, a, a ton of emphasis or, or a ton of analysis on this until we get towards the middle to late part of, of, of August and really, especially, um, as, as we get towards the end of September when the debates start and we get to really see these two men on the stage with each other uh, because that is what the world is waiting for. Um, and, and that if, if, if Trump's got a shot going forward, it's, it's probably going to be in that, in that window between when the debates start and the election is there. Awesome. Well, uh, Scott, really appreciate the time. Um, I've got a couple kind of bullet points here of, of just takeaways from what we've covered. But while we have uh, been talking, a, a couple questions have come in. So, Maybe I'll start with one, and, and we talked about um, the high-frequency data early on, and specifically we were looking at some of the uh, domestic-focused data, and a question came in, kind of what are, what are our thoughts on opportunities from an international perspective, and, and Scott, maybe I'll start, but then toss it to you. I think we've seen some data internationally that would suggest that uh, the reopening internationally is, is maybe 
uh, taking place at a, even a faster pace in Europe, and, and obviously China is, is much further along than we are. Uh, so we, I, I would think it would be fair to say we do think there are opportunities there. Uh, anything, Scott, that you would add to that? Yeah, we, no, we, we do. Um, we, we do think there are opportunities in both in Europe and emerging markets. Um, you know, I, I highlighted that, that you know the China is relatively small on the stimulus side right now. Um, there is certainly room for that to grow. Uh, but 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 you but you said it right, Austin. I mean, you know, they were ahead of us, ahead of us on getting the virus. They're ahead of us on getting rid of the virus and getting back towards normal. Um, and and that should bode well for economic activity. Europe especially uh, is, is especially sort of interesting right now. And we're not we're not um, long term fans of, of European exposure. But 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 for for points of time, it could be interesting because the, the makeup of the European market is is very much cyclical, um, and so it's very much tied to economic activity. And if you do get that, you know, if you do get Economic activity and consumer activity kind of getting back towards normal. Um, people are generally underinvested in Europe. Like it could be, it could make it for a nice, you know, like a, a nice, you know, short to medium term play. So, Scott, another question that, that came in, and I know we've gotten this uh, through conversations with, with a couple folks over the last uh, month or so. With the amount and basically speed of, of the Fed action to really kind of smooth out market activity and, and really provide kind of that buoy, does that cut off tail risk going forward or does that shorten future recessions? I mean, is the Fed going to serve as that backstop or is this more of just a, a, a one-time or, or maybe a, a pandemic-oriented, uh, uh, I would say, activity? You know, it's it's obviously impossible to know uh, with with certainty, but the way they've responded and reacted to the last two meaningful drawdowns in equity markets and, and the fourth quarter of 2018 and um, and and you know this first quarter of this year um, would suggest that they view uh, the level and the basically they they view risk risk assets or risk markets more more credit more on the credit side, but certainly related to equities. Um, they view them as as important to their mandate of uh, price stability and and, and full employment. Um, they're they're very scared of being trapped in a deflationary spiral like Japan was 25 years ago and is still in. So the the, the onset of deflationary expectations that accompany really bad equity markets or really bad risk markets for protect, protracted periods of time is something that they're very frightened of. It appears. Um, and so again, we can argue about whether or not that's a good idea or, or a bad idea or whether we agree with it or not. But but it does appear their reaction function has has shifted uh, to be to viewing the SP 500 and, and, and investment grade credit spreads as being important towards their mandate. Uh, so one one last question that, that has come in, and it looks like this may kind of wrap it up for us. Um, we obviously saw uh, growth stocks uh, pretty significantly outperform really through the, uh, through the first six months of the year. And, and I think the question was posed at, at this point, what is it, you know, what's it going to take to cause a, a value rotation? Is, is there anything that, that can cause that? Yeah, treatment. Um, so, so you, you know, you don't, you don't get out of whether that's, a, whether that's treatment of the disease or a vaccine. Don't, don't, don't really care. Something that makes people not afraid that, that they're going to die and therefore eliminates the possibility of further uh, shutdowns, economic shutdowns. So, you know, in, 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 order, in order to get value securities to, and small caps for that matter, to perform, um, like we need to get, Sustained economic activity picking up, and we need to make uh, make top line revenue growth great again. Like we're not like like right now, top line revenue growth is challenged because the economy is was shut down for a bit and is still not operating at full capacity. So anytime the top line revenue growth is challenged, uh, firms that can get top line revenue growth, uh, good good top line rev re revenue growth, command a premium. Those are right now are the growth companies They're dominated by the healthcare and tech. Um, and, and so that, you know, and like the, the way you reverse that is you get some sort of treatment for the disease that, that eliminates the, prob the, the, the chance that you can get the economic outcome that we got in March and April. Um, so without that, we think it's going to be, things can be tough. The problem with, with that, with that out, without out outlook is that there's no, you know, like nobody has the crystal ball. Like, like there's no edge in betting on the vaccine. Nobody knows anything. Um, and, and so, you know, like we can diagnose and we can, we can understand what we think the drivers are that would lead to a, a material value rotation. Um, but, but forecasting that ahead of time is frankly like impossible. Um, like we'll, we'll recognize it when we see it and we'll, we'll, we will back fairly quickly, but, but positioning ahead of it, um, is, is, is really pretty challenging. Awesome. Well, Scott, really appreciate you taking the time with us today and, and for everybody on the phone, really appreciate uh, you dialing in, uh, we 
absolutely look forward to the individual calls that we'll be holding over the next couple of weeks with, with everybody on the phone today. Uh, look forward to connecting. Hopefully, uh, everyone is staying safe and staying healthy. Um, and we want to just say thanks again for the continued uh, partnership, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks so much.